Perfect. All right. Well, thank you, David. And thank you everyone for being here today. I'm super excited to be spending my Friday afternoon with you talking all about how to build aquaculture literacy through social media. So as David said, my name is Emily D'Souza and I am a fishery scientist and a content creator. I run a brand called Seaside with Emily. And my objective with this brand is to educate consumers about all types of seafood and really show them where their fish is coming from and what goes on behind the scenes of the seafood industry. So I went to the University of Guelph here in Canada. I studied environmental studies and then I did my master's degree where I studied actually small scale fisheries um, and have been working online for the last eight, almost nine years as an influencer and um, specifically in the seafood influencer space for the last four or so. And so I spend the majority of my time traveling the world, showing people different seafood cultures around the world and visiting different fish farms to show people the behind the scenes of the aquaculture industry so that they can understand it a little bit better. And so just as an overview, this is a look at what my audience is and the types of people that I reach. So I am mostly speaking to a millennial audience, mostly millennial women in the United States and Canada, but increasingly reaching more global audiences um, due to the fact that I am traveling most of the year and get to visit um, some really cool places and see different aquaculture um, operations around the world. And so I want to start off by just talking about why social media, you know, why, why should we care? Why are we talking about social media today? And why is this an important tool for building aquaculture literacy? So the reality is, is that social media is kind of taking over everybody's lives. It's what we all use for information. Um, people turn to social media as a news outlet. They turn to social media for information. They turn to social media before making a purchasing decision. I know I'm personally guilty of this. Anytime I'm looking for a recipe, I'm searching it up on the TikTok search bar, or I'm looking it up on Pinterest. We're currently moving. And so I'm searching social media for a ton of interior design inspiration. People used to talk about Google University when, you know, everything became accessible on the internet. And Google University is actually kind of dead now because it's just social media university. Anything that people could ever want to learn or know, they're turning to social media to find out. And the reason that this is so important for aquaculture literacy and for seafood is because this is where consumers already are. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to create a new platform where consumers can go for information. We don't need to add this extra step or extra work for us. Consumers are already on social media. This is already where they're looking for information. All we need to do is make aquaculture information more accessible on the platforms where people are already looking for it. And the reality is, is that consumers are looking for it. People are curious about where their food is coming from and specifically where their seafood is coming from. For a lot of people who aren't fortunate enough to live near the ocean, the ocean can be out of sight and out of mind. And so people aren't thinking about the ocean regularly. They're not thinking about seafood regularly. I personally don't live near an ocean. And I could say that the amount of times that I think about seafood is very different than the average person who lives in this region. It's just, it's not an issue that they're thinking about all the time because it's not an issue that they're exposed to. And this knowledge gap becomes even wider when we think about aquaculture, you know, Whereas you could speak to somebody at the grocery store and talk to them about seafood and maybe ask them to picture a fishing boat or a fishing vessel. They could generally come up with an image of, in their mind of what a fishing boat looks like. It might not be the most accurate image, um, but they're generally able to picture, you know, what a boat looks like, what a fishing rod looks like, maybe what a net looks like coming out of the ocean. They can picture those things in their mind. But if you're asking somebody, you know, that you run into at the grocery store to picture a fish farm or picture an aquaculture operation, it's a little bit more challenging. And, you know, although aquaculture isn't necessarily a new technology for most average consumers, it is entirely new. And their extent of knowledge about it might be a social media headline or a New York Times headline that they read 10 or 20 years ago, and they don't know anything else about aquaculture. And so there's a really big knowledge gap that needs to be filled that can be done so through social media. And just to kind of illustrate how wide that knowledge gap can be between consumers and the aquaculture industry, um, these are just some screenshots. I, I've worked closely. I'm, I'm based in Niagara Falls, Ontario, here in Canada, and I've worked closely with the Ontario Aquaculture Association a lot, and I have done um, some social media campaigns with them. And before we launched some of our social media campaigns a couple of years ago, I wanted to gauge where consumers were at in their knowledge of aquaculture in Ontario. And 
relative to the world, Ontario is not a massive aquaculture player, um, but we do have a pretty significantly large aquaculture industry here in Ontario, specifically for rainbow trout. And so before we started our campaigns, I went onto social media and I asked people, did you know that we farm seafood in Ontario? Again, we're a landlocked region. We are on the Great Lakes, um, but not on an ocean. And so almost half the people that follow me didn't necessarily know that we farm seafood here in Ontario. And when I asked which of these species is not farmed in Ontario, the majority of people said bear mundi, which is actually not true. Um, the only species from that list that we don't farm in Ontario are oysters. And so again, there are these knowledge gaps that exist, albeit this is not uh, a perfectly um, academically credible uh, sample size here, but this is just taken from you know the 15,000 or so people who follow me on social media, but who are, I would say, somewhat already engaged in seafood um, and had this big knowledge gap between what's going on in Ontario aquaculture. So just interesting to see where people are at. Um, and I also think a very interesting reminder, especially when you're somebody who has been in the seafood industry for so long and, you know, been elbow deep in the weeds and the technicality of fish farming and aquaculture. Um, it's a nice reminder that sometimes we have to take a step back or sometimes several steps back in order to meet consumers um, where they're at when it comes to aquaculture and seafood awareness. <clears throat> and I want to emphasize that there is a thirst for this information. Consumers are curious. So we go back to that last slide and we can see that, okay, they don't necessarily know a lot right now. They don't necessarily know that we, you know, are farming seafood in the ways that we are, or what species that we're farming, but they want to know more. And this has been demonstrated across tons of consumer studies, especially in the last four or five years, that consumers really want to know about where their seafood is coming from. And this study is specifically looking at um, sustainability and traceability, which is becoming increasingly more of a concern amongst consumers as you know, people become more aware of climate change and the impact of their food choices. They want to have that power of choice and that freedom of choice. They want to go to the grocery store and they want to know that the seafood that they're buying is not contributing to some of these you know, overfishing problems that, again, maybe they've only seen a headline on or that it's not contributing to some of the damage on the ocean floor that they've heard about salmon farms, again, likely from a headline. So they want to feel confident in the seafood that they're buying. They want better information um, so that they can feel empowered in the choices that they're making. And I mean, these numbers are all very high. This is a study from the Marine Stewardship Council. So um, not necessarily speaking to aquaculture specifically, but speaking to seafood generally that consumers want to hear more from seafood companies about the sustainability and the traceability of their products. And again, they just wanna know that they're buying seafood from a trusted source, something they can feel good about. Now, this is another consumer um, research report that came out a few years ago, and I really love this, and I love the work that this group does. This is by Changing Taste, and they are a consumer research organization, and they produced a fantastic report a couple of years ago about seafood consumers. And they were specifically looking at the shift from consumers who are choosing to eat less meat, which is you know, a trend that we see increasing, again, for various different reasons, a lot of them tied to sustainability and climate change, and a lot of them tied to nutrition health reasons. I particularly like this graph because it shows the different motivations for why people choose to eat fish and seafood as opposed to meat, so why they're making this shift. And the reason that I like this graph um, is because it shows a good range of reasons why people are making this shift but it's also showing this breakdown by generation, by age. And if you see here, you can see that boomers are, are more likely to replace meat and fish, uh, meat with fish and seafood due to their heart or th they want more healthy fat. So a lot of these reasons tied to health and well-being. If we look more towards the middle, we can see that Gen Z and millennials, so those younger consumers generally under the age of 40, are more, more motivated to switch to fish and seafood for a variety of environmental reasons. So they're curious about you know, antibiotic use, they're curious about the impact on the ocean ecosystem, on the ocean floor, um, bycatch, other marine species, et cetera. And the reason that I think this breakdown by generation is important um, is because whenever we're communicating, whether that's in an academic paper or on social media, we're communicating with someone. There is somebody on the other end who is digesting this information. And we need to think about who that person is, who we're writing for, who we're creating content for, who is gonna resonate with this information. 
And I think this graph is a good illustration because if we're trying to reach, let's say a boomer audience, but we're talking about the environmental impact of farm seafood, it's likely not going to resonate with that demographic of people. They're not necessarily choosing seafood for those reasons. However, if we're trying to reach Gen Z and millennials, then we want to touch on those sustainability factors and we want to tell them why aquaculture is good for the environment. And so I think this is also important to keep in mind as we think about social media. Social media users obviously range from a variety of demographics from age and gender um, and you know country demographics, but overwhelmingly some of the more popular platforms like TikTok and Instagram are run by a Gen Z and millennial audience. And so I like to put this graphic up here just to keep in mind the issues and the topics that are most important to that age group when we're using social media. And I would argue that as uh, an aquaculture industry and a seafood industry, we could be doing a lot better job of speaking to those younger consumers um, about seafood and aquaculture. And I really think that this demographic has largely been left behind by the seafood industry, but that again, we have a real opportunity right now to tap into them. Um, and we really should because Gen Z and millennials are currently kind of running the world, um, whether we like it or not. I'm not sure about the age range of everybody on this call, but I know that everybody likes to poke fun at Gen Z and millennials, um, sometimes for good reasons. I'm a millennial and I will admit, um, we all, every demographic has their own crazy things that they do, but millennials and Gen Z right now are really running the world. They have the largest buying power in the market and they have a massive influence over major industries from food and travel and education. And they're also the fastest growing demographic of seafood consumer. So we know from the FAO report on the state of the world's fisheries and aquaculture that came out two years ago, and we'll have a new version released this summer, that seafood consumption is at an all-time high. And a lot of that is being driven by young people. In 2021, there was a 30% increase in seafood consumption by millennials. Again, a lot of this could have been driven by the pandemic. Um, we'll be able to really gauge these statistics when the new FAO report comes out this summer. But generally speaking, from the data that we have, everything indicates that millennials and Gen Z are eating more seafood than ever before. And one last reason that I just want to uh, pinpoint why we should be talking to this younger demographic is that millennials and Gen Z are also raising the next generation of seafood consumer. So getting today's millennials and Gen Z interested and educated about aquaculture and seafood is not just changing the seafood consumption habits and the aquaculture awareness of today's generation, but it's actually changing the consumption habits of generations to come. And I don't know about you guys, but I think it's pretty safe to say that kids who don't grow up eating seafood generally don't become adults who eat seafood. Um, if you grow up eating seafood, it's much easier It's much easier to you know become an adult who eats seafood. Seafood can be a weird thing to suddenly jump into in your 20s and 30s if you've never been exposed to it as a child. Um, and so it's definitely a good thing to get them started at an early age with seafood. And moving over to talk more specifically about aquaculture, seafood is the perfect protein for young people. I think it speaks to a lot of the concerns that young people have, again, about feeding you know, their bodies healthy and nutritious foods, especially if they're raising young kids, what's the best food to feed my kids? It speaks to a lot of their sustainability and environmental concerns. But millennials and Gen Z are also far more receptive to alternative proteins. And that can be some of these plant-based options, cell-based options, but also farmed seafood, which is considered in this alternative proteins category um, by some of these consumer research reports. Whereas we see that older consumers who are generally born before 64 have a little bit of a stronger preference for wild fish, um, which can be attributed to a lot of different factors. Um, the way that aquaculture you know, first started out um, is very different than where aquaculture is right now. And so what we see is that younger consumers are generally more receptive to aquaculture. Um, they're more willing to try farm seafoods. They're more receptive to learning about farm seafoods. Um, and over half of millennials consider all forms of aquaculture to be acceptable, which I think really speaks volumes, um, especially when you consider the current climate around aquaculture production in certain parts of the world. And so I just want to share some case studies and some examples of the ways that I personally have used social media um, in my own business to communicate with the general public about aquaculture. I'm also just going to say that I can see there's like notifications in the chat, but I can't see the chat. So if anybody has questions, I'll answer them um, at the end. So 
one of the ways that I use social media and probably I think my favorite way to use social media to communicate aquaculture and what I would consider the most effective way is to take consumers behind the scenes. And so that's what I mean when I say that I am literally, you know, spending 200 days on the road, visiting fish farms around the world. I'm out there with iPhones, microphones, cameras, showing people, here's exactly what a fish farm looks like. You know, I talked at the very beginning of this presentation, how generally speaking, people have a, a harder time visualizing what a fish farm looks like versus what a fishing boat looks like. This is how we can help to remedy that problem. So one example is um, a couple of years ago, I worked with the Newfoundland Aquaculture Industry Alliance here on Canada's East Coast, and we went out and we visited a handful of mussel and oyster farms to try to raise awareness about um, mussels and oysters being grown in Newfoundland, oysters in specific being a newer species to the region. And I took them out to these farms. I showed them here's what baby oysters look like. Here's what they look like when they're being grown. We did a whole sort of what I like to call an egg to plate experience, showing them exactly where they start in the hatchery, when they go into the water, how they're taken care of. And then of course we always eat them because ultimately we're talking about food. And I would argue that's the most important part <laughs> to show people is that um, yes, this is healthy and yes, it's sustainable, but also it tastes great. And so this campaign was really successful, um, especially for being a small, more regional organization. And um, I like to highlight some of the comments that we get here. You can see that there was a really great response from the general public on TikTok. Um, people saying that they're interested in buying these oysters. They're curious about where they're coming from. Um, you know, someone kind of making a joke saying, I'll do my part for the environment and enjoy these oysters, because of course we're talking about the restorative benefits of oyster farming, um, which again is new, is new knowledge to a lot of people. So um, really great response on this. Again, people are curious. They wanna see what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and so I always encourage people uh, getting an iPhone and showing them hatchery, a lab, um, a fish farm is one of the easiest ways that we can get people um, excited and more aware about what's going on in aquaculture. Now, this was part of a much larger campaign that I did with Maui, who is um, a massive salmon farming company that has farms all over the world. And we actually did um, a week long expedition with Maui where I actually went on to a sailboat with them and we sailed across the Caribbean, raising awareness for blue foods um, and the future of the blue economy. Alongside that expedition though, we also created a ton of recipe videos showing people how they could use farm salmon at home. We talked a lot about eco labels like ASC. We talked about sustainable packaging. We talked about value add and oven ready products. Um, and we're just generally trying to address some of the stigmas and concerns that we see, especially about farm salmon from the average consumers. And um, we can see here, you know, this campaign reached over 300,000 people. It had a very high engagement rate. And again, Looking at the comments, I think this is really where I look to gauge whether or not this content is resonating with people. Um, reaching a million people doesn't necessarily mean anything. I think the comments are a much better way to indicate if what we're doing is actually working. And we can see here that we're getting a lot of good responses from chefs. Um, we're getting a lot of good responses from consumers. We're getting some DMs from people who are saying, you're making me take a second look at farmed salmon. And I think Anytime I see something like that, um, I feel very happy. I feel like I've done my job uh, because that's exactly what I want to do is I want people to look beyond the headlines um, and just take a second look. Is this really what I thought it was? Is this something different? Get curious. Um, and social media is a really great tool for, uh, for shaking up people's curiosity. <clears throat> So now that I've shared some examples of how I view social media, I want to just share some social media best practices. So if you are interested, if I've convinced you that social media is a powerful tool and you want to start talking about aquaculture and seafood online, I want to share with you how you can do that on, on TikTok, Instagram, and other social media platforms. I focus a lot on short form video content for, for the content that I produce, uh, because again, I'm generally trying to reach a millennial and Gen Z audience who are on TikTok and Instagram and very receptive to those 30 second videos that just tell them exactly what they need to know in a short period of time. But all of these tools and, and best practices that I'm about to share can be applied to other platforms as well, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, et cetera. So I wanna start off by sharing the general formula that I use when approaching social media content. And generally what I think we're trying to do, this is the framework that I've compiled um, after working online for eight years, is that we want to educate people, we want to connect with them, and then we want to mobilize them. So whenever I create a piece of content for social media, I'm always doing so with these three steps in mind. 
I want to share information. I want to share knowledge. I want to communicate science with consumers. I want them to feel more competent and knowledgeable about the subject matter from consuming this content. But then I also want to connect with them. And this is a key part of social media content and communicating with consumers online that often gets missed. People go on social media to connect. They want to engage with people. They want to feel some sort of personal connection. I know this seems weird. Why not just go out and talk to people in person? But this is the world that we live in. People connect on social media and finding ways to facilitate that sort of personal and emotional connection online is very important for actually getting people to engage with your content and then ultimately do something with your content, which is what we want them to do when we mobilize them. Ultimately, we're sharing content and we're educating consumers and we're communicating science and sharing this knowledge for a reason. We want them to do something with it, whether that's, you know, go buy farm seafood in the grocery store, look for an eco label, um, reach out to their local aquaculture association, maybe investigate a university aquaculture program. There's always a purpose behind what we're sharing. We're not just sharing information for the sake of sharing. We're sharing because we're trying to achieve a desired goal. And so it's always important that we have this mobilization step at the end that we're telling people, here's what, what I want you to do with the information that I've just given you. And so keeping that framework in mind, I want to share some five tips that are kind of nestled in this framework um, that I think are a good starting point for anybody who wants to start talking about aquaculture online. And the first tip, and it's cheesy, I get it, every influencer will tell you, but you have to be authentic. Again, <laughs> social media is about being social. It's about personal connection and people want to connect with people. So one of the easiest things that I tell people to do in terms of authenticity and personal connection is to show your face on the camera. And I know it's uncomfortable, especially at first. Believe me, I have walked around many public places talking to my iPhone um, and gotten many weird looks. It's weird. I get it. But you've just got to get over it. And in 2024, everybody's an influencer, so everybody's doing it. So you shouldn't feel weird about it. But getting in front of the camera is such a small thing, but makes such a big difference on social media. And I've taken two screenshots of social media accounts here, albeit this is a little bit biased because one of them is mine, but I'm using this for the sake of showing you the differences between this sort of like corporate brand account that's trying to connect with seafood consumers and trying to teach people about seafood in a really inauthentic way. There's no personal connection. There's no attempt to engage with people on that emotional level. Whereas with my content, you can see almost every piece of content has me in it. It has my face in it. You can see me. You can see that there's a person, a real person who runs this account. And that's so critical because all the social media data that we have tells us that content that includes somebody's face has a much higher engagement rate than content that doesn't have a real person. And it goes a long way to building trust and human connection, which is really ultimately how we get people to trust what we're talking about and do something with the information that we're giving them, especially when we're talking about science. Um, there is a growing mistrust in science and scientific knowledge and building trust and human connection can go a long way to, to rebuilding and mending that trust. So having your face, having some sort of human element to it is really big. I mean, if you even just look at these two images, you can see that the one on the left, again, it's very corporate. It, it looks beautiful. I'm sure this company spent a lot of time and money and hired, you know, recipe developers and chefs and food photographers and had like a professionally styled photo shoot in order to get this content. But when I look at this content, I don't feel any sort of connection. I don't see a person that I can relate to. I don't see anything that I can relate to. Frankly, all I see are seafood dishes that if I tried to recreate at home are probably never going to look that way. And so it's not very inspiring and it's not very engaging. Whereas you look at my content and again, you can see me in grocery stores. You can see me preparing seafood dishes that do not look anything like the seafood dishes on the left. You can see that we're cycling. Like you can see all these things that could be relatable to the average person, regardless of if you're a seafood lover or not. So connecting with the audience and getting in front of the camera is my number, number one tip. Now, the second tip is to be quick. And I... I know how difficult this can be, especially when we're talking about very new and nuanced and scientific topics. Science communication, um, and you know, David and I were chatting about this beforehand, is a whole beast in itself. And teaching science communication skills are it's very difficult to do. But mastering science communication, I would say it's is probably one of the best things I've ever done in my life is learning how to 
communicate science in a very quick way in layman's terms that the average person can understand. It is incredibly difficult, but it is incredibly powerful. Um, and especially when we're talking about communicating science on social media, millennials are tech savvy. They get their information from social media, but their attention spans are short. And I should say, it's not just millennials. Anybody on social media has a short attention span. I know I have been very guilty of, you know, you just watch like the first second or two of video and you're just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. So if you don't hook people in that first second or two seconds, they're gone. And then what other, whatever information you were about to share after those first two seconds is wasted. And you could have spent hours, days, weeks perfecting this beautiful video where you're thoughtfully and articulately explaining a very nuanced scientific topic in 45 seconds. But if you don't tell them in that first two seconds, if you don't hook them, it was all for nothing. So be quick kind of encompasses two things. One of them is learning how to communicate your science in under 60 seconds. And again, I know it's difficult, but it is the most powerful thing you will ever learn how to do. I always say that if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, then you don't know it well enough yourself. And really that is the level that we're talking about. And I don't want, people use the phrase like dumbing it down. I don't like that phrase. Consumers aren't dumb. People on social media aren't dumb. They just simply don't have the interest, frankly, in, in listening to a very long, drawn out scientific explanation. Every time you create social media content, you should think as if you're explaining it to a niece or nephew, a neighbor, somebody who's six years old. How would you tell them about fish farming? How would you tell them about aquaculture? And keep that in mind as you're creating content. And then the second part of being quick is, of course, having something exciting to grab their attention right off the bat. I mean, it's, again, very similar to a six-year-old. You want to get their attention very quickly, hook them, and then they'll watch the rest of the video um, or listen to whatever it is that you have to say. The hook works for video content, but it also works for written content. I do this a lot on LinkedIn as well. That first sentence should be a hook. It should be something um provocative, engaging, potentially controversial, get people to stop scrolling um, and then, you know, click open and read the rest of your LinkedIn post. And then again, you don't want to go into a massive um, long essay because as soon as someone clicks read more and they see 17 paragraphs of text, they're probably not going to read it all. So quick hook and then quick explanation. Alongside being quick though, is to be clear. Um, so we want to be very fast in what we're saying, but we don't want to be, um, you know, mumbling and jumbling and and making it so confusing and overwhelming that consumers just click off. And again, we also want to tell people what we want them to do with the information that we're giving them. We want a clear call to action. We want to mobilize them. So social media data also tells us that content that has a call to action is way more effective and gets way more engagement on social media. And People who have a clear call to action in their social media, people are 83% more likely to actually do it. And what I mean by having a clear call to action is, again, telling people exactly what you want them to do with the content that you've just given them. So, for example, in a lot of my content, I am directing people to go visit a link, for example. Maybe I have written a full length blog post and I want people to dive deeper into a topic, which is also a great strategy for some of these larger scientific topics. I will create a 30, 45 second video for social media that explains very simply at a very high level, astaxanthin, for example, how to farm salmon, get their color. 30 to 45 seconds. If you wanna learn more, click the link in my bio. It's a clear call to action. If you wanna do this, I'm telling you to go here. This is exactly what you need to do. Again, social media is a lot like talking to a six-year-old. You really want to hold people's hands, walk them through it, explain things clearly and simply, and then tell them, okay, now that you know this, here's what we're going to do with that information. And again, it could be as simple as going to a link in your bio. It could be as big as coming, you know, come join us at our event. It could be as simple as getting signatures um, for if you're lobbying government or if you want people to make a purchase, if you want people to visit their local seafood counter, there's a variety of calls to action. Um, but keeping in mind what you want people to do with the content is really important and will go a long way to getting more engagement on your content. Okay, tip number four is to be fun. Um, social media is a fun place, right? It's all about expressing creativity. It's all about expressing personality. Being fun is another great way that we connect with people. And um, I know we have a, a mix of people on the call here today, but I know I normally give this talk to companies, seafood companies, and um, they always have very strict brand guidelines and, you know, sort of um, 
restrictions that they have to stay within lines they have to walk within uh when they're when they're sharing social media content and um that may very well be true for a lot of the positions that many of you are in whether that's with a private company or with an ngo or an academic institution you might have communication guidelines that you need to adhere to i would encourage um some pushing of the boundaries um <laughs> i don't want anybody to go get themselves in trouble here but i would encourage if you know the person who makes these guidelines if you have anybody that you can talk to about these guidelines push the boundaries a little bit, especially in today's age of social media, people who post content that is slick and funny and borders on this line that is not necessarily inappropriate, but makes people laugh is really, really powerful and effective. And again, it goes a long way to creating that personal connection with people. So these are just examples of how I've used humor in my content you can be the judge of if they're actually funny or not. Um, but, you know, I'm a big Star Wars nerd. That's a very th big thing that people know about me. I love Star Wars. And so when Seaspiracy came out, I used Star Wars memes to make fun of the movie um, and to connect with people on, you know, this is why this is ridiculous kind of thing. Um, and people who are scrolling at that time through Twitter might see this meme, might know nothing about seafood, nothing about aquaculture and see a Star Wars meme and think, oh, that's funny. Um, I like Star Wars, I'm going to engage with this content. And then content like this is also a little bit of an inside joke, because if you like Star Wars, but you haven't seen Seaspiracy, you don't maybe exactly get why this is funny. And so now you want to follow because you want to be in on the joke. You want to understand why this is funny. Same with this other meme. I'm also a huge football fan, Buffalo Bills fan, still emotionally recovering from last week. Um, but you can see here again, if you're a football fan, you might understand like the premise of why this is funny, but you might not get it entirely. Like why, why, why do we feel this way about our fishermen and water farmers? And again, it's an opportunity to engage an audience that might not have been otherwise engaged. Um, I used to have another slide in here, but actually I think it I took it out. But one of the best organizations that I think uses humor in a really effective way to engage with people on social media is Duolingo. Um, if you've ever seen Duolingo on TikTok, their videos are really funny. They poke fun of pop culture moments and they get people to engage with their content and ultimately sign up for their language learning app. And again, brand accounts that can push these boundaries are doing really well. And I mean, obviously I follow the NFL and so I see this a lot too. You can see this in the social media managers who run the accounts of NFL teams. They're being a little bit more out there with the way that they talk about other teams, they're being a little bit funnier, they're really pushing um, the boundaries of, you know, what would have been quote unquote acceptable in their official brand guidelines. And so I encourage people to get creative and get fun with it. Um, it's It makes for good entertainment, which is ultimately why many people are on social media, but it's a good way to also sneak in that educational content in your entertainment. And then again, create that personal connection, which is so important um, to getting people to resonate with your content. And finally, Share your why. So there's a common phrase in marketing that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And we know ultimately that people don't act based on facts, right? Um, again, this is not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just the reality of where we're at. People do not act based on facts. We've seen this for decades with climate change. We saw this during the, um, the COVID pandemic. People don't just take numbers and statistics and scientific information and and make a decision based, based off of that. It's just not the way that people work. We're emotional creatures and that's why we crave that personal connection. And that's why my number one tip was to engage with people on a personal level because a lot of our decision making is values based and it's emotional. And so when we're talking to people online and we're sharing our science, we also need to communicate with people why this is important and why why should they care about aquaculture why should we care about farm seafood why should we care about how seafood is being farmed why do you care and that's a great place to start if you can't figure out why other people should care if you can't figure out why this should be important to other people just tell them why this is important to you and i do this all the time in my own content i constantly re reiterate my personal story why do i care about this and i have told it a hundred times over and it's important to continue to drill into people why you do it and why it's important because people can resonate with you. I tell people all the time, you know, my family's from Portugal. We're from the Azores Islands. I come from an island nation that is literally dependent on seafood for food security, for economic livelihoods, for culture. And so that's part of the reason why seafood is so important to me. 
And people can resonate with that story. They can resonate with coming from a different place and immigrating to Canada or the US and how important their own food culture and their own traditions are to their life and their family and how they would feel, you know, if people didn't understand it and how excited they are to bring people into their own food traditions. And so sharing your own personal story is a good way to connect with people. And then you can get, as you do, as you do more content on social media, you can start to communicate Here's why this should also matter to you. Here are the effects of aquaculture and fish farming on your life. Again, really trying to keep in mind, pulling on those values and on those emotional connections. Um, obviously, we want to give people the facts. We want to give them the data. But ultimately, we need to have this values-based component to get people to act and mobilize, which is ultimately the last step in this framework. And so just to kind of nestle all those tips into the framework so you can see where they all fit in. Um, again, the first step is that we want to educate people. We want to arm people with facts. We want to make them feel confident in their knowledge about seafood and aquaculture. So that's where that, you know, being quick comes in, communicating the facts and the science to them very quickly, very easily in a way that they can understand. And then we want to connect with them. We want to build that trust and that personal connection. We want to help them understand your own why, your own story, and why they should care. So that's where things like being authentic, showing your face, getting on camera, and being funny come into play. And then finally, we want to mobilize them. We want to get them to do something. Um, I always say that, you know, if we just educate and connect with people, but, but don't mobilize with them, we're just going to have a lot of really smart friends on social media. And that's great. <laughs> but ultimately, you know, again, we're doing this for a purpose and we want people to be more educated and aware of aquaculture, but we want them to then take that information and do something with it. Again, whether it's driving seafood sales, whether it's enrolling in an aquaculture program, or just starting a conversation amongst their own peer group about sustainable fish farming. So don't forget this mobilizing component in your content. And I just want to say also, you know, I talked a lot in the beginning about young consumers and Gen Z and millennials. And um, again, obviously, I'm a bit biased. I'm a millennial and I talk to millennials. Um, but it's not just millennials and Gen Z who are who are driving the shift right now. Obviously, they really are playing a big part in this. But we are a big a big world with many different people. And ultimately, right now, what we're seeing is a global trend um, where people are shifting their diets overwhelmingly away from meat and sea or meat and um away from meat and towards fish and seafood. Uh, we're seeing this shift on a really big scale. People are calling this a once in a generation transition. The amount of interest people have in their food systems, the amount of curiosity that people have about their food products is unprecedented. And so I think right now, given that there is this massive interest and there are so many people looking for this information about how they can change their diet, how they can eat better for themselves and how they can eat better for the planet. Again, I've said it a hundred times, I feel like during this presentation, but this is a really big opportunity for aquaculture to capitalize on this moment and could ultimately end up reshaping the, the future of the long term of our food systems. And I will just end off. So I, I wanted to give us plenty of time for questions here at the end, um, but I will just end off by saying that if you found this helpful and interesting and you're curious about learning more about communicating about aquaculture online, science communication, social media, um, any of that, we have a weekly newsletter that we send out called the Seaside Brew. Um, I joke that it's the morning brew of the seafood industry, if anybody subscribes to that newsletter. Um, or I also like to call it Tea from the Sea. So we send out Tea from the Sea every Monday morning. Um, in those emails, there's a lot of deep dives into various aquacultures and fish fisheries issues, um, hot takes on different industry stuff, and then, of course, a lot of different marketing tips, um, more guidance and resources on how to communicate science online, how to talk about seafood on social media, um, how to build an influencer brand if that's of interest to people. So... Um, I know this is quick and I packed a lot of information in. So if you are curious in learning more or accessing more resources, um, you can sign up for that email list and that goes out every Monday. Um, but that um, link is up there and I can also share that afterwards as well. But I wanted to thank you all again uh, for joining me on this Friday afternoon. I hope this was helpful and informative. And yeah, I'm really excited if people have questions to talk a little bit more about how we can use social media to build aquaculture literacy, because I really do think that um, we're at a really exciting opportunity here. So thank you.